Theater Talk is made possible in part by the CUNY TV Foundation. but I had a sudden presentiment that I was going to have a puncture. So I went back to pick up my pump. And then, of course, I didn't have a puncture at all. <laughs> From New York City, this is Theatre Talk. I'm the show's producer, Susan Haskins. And I'm Michael Riedel of the New York Post. When people ask me, what must I see on Broadway this season, I say, you must not miss Angela Lansbury in Blythe Spirit. And I'm so happy that she's with us tonight. <laughs> Welcome, Angela Lansbury, to Theatre Talk. Thank you so much. Yes. Now, it's true. Everybody is talking about this performance as Madame Arcadi in Blythe mm -hmm. Spirit, particularly this extraordinary dance that you do. <laughs> <laughs> now, you're, you're playing a medium in this, in this, yes. in this famous Noel Coward play, <laughs> and you contact the spiritual world. And as you get yourself um, sort of revved up to talk to the other side, you put on, I believe it's an Irving Berlin song, Always. Always. That's right. And then you launch into this extraordinary bit of choreography. Is that yours? Uh, yes. Yes, <laughs> it is. <laughs> I, was, I was given leave to do this by the director. Michael but, Blakemore. But, uh, Michael yep. Blakemore, but also by Noel Coward. Really? In his stage direction. It says in the very fine print italics, she begins to do an aborted dance, a little <laughs> aborted dance. Now, th those simple words clicked <laughs> in my naughty brain, and I thought, ah, here's a chance to show how she at uh, attracted the spirits. Mm -hmm. What she wanted to do was to create a mood in which the spirits would come, and that she would be able to uh, achieve what she set out to do, which was to bring about uh, the appearance of a ghost. Mm -hmm. Well, she wasn't always successful, and uh, she was very unsuccessful, in fact, but nevertheless, this was her style of doing, of, of, of uh, having a seance. It's nobody else's, but I, it's my version of Mrs. of Madame Alcati. So, uh, we should say, for those who don't know the play, you're the, the town's renowned eccentric and, and medium. Well, I am, yes. I come from London. I, I'm a new resident in the area, and uh, they invite me because Mr. Condamine, who is the host for the evening, has met me on another occasion uh, at some kind of a spiritual gathering, and also she's a, she's a writer. She mm -hmm. writes children's books. Yes. <laughs> so she has an extremely interesting and creative and rather uh, whimsical mind, to say the least. Mm. Well, that whimsical is a great description of this dance. Now, do you change this choreography every night, or is have you? Is this like you know Bob Fosse or Michael Bennett choreography? <laughs> You've set it in stone, and it's been written down for future productions. No, it's different every <laughs> night. It, it depends on what I've had for dinner, what my bones are feeling like, and my muscles. And uh, no, I, I I like to feel that I can change it because there is no choreographer. Uh, it's up to me, yeah. and I created in the first place. Well, the one I saw, you uh, you are almost doing a Cheetah Rivera leg lift. The leg went very high the night I saw the you show. You said that, and yeah. I, I don't even remember it, but I probably couldn't walk the next day. <laughs> <laughs> I don't believe it. Um, did you, in your, uh, in your travels through show business, did you ever meet Noel Coward? I did meet him on very briefly, uh, mm. sadly. Um, Oh, but back in the 70s, I would have said. I met him at the Plaza Hotel at a wonderful reception in, in which he and Marlene Dietrich were being fated. Mm -hmm. But other than that, I never had the chance. Any uh, Im uh, impression he made on you or any Not memories? Not really. Of no, he, I, I know that he came to see me in various shows. And uh, I wrote in his diary that he had seen me in... Uh, for instance, in Dear World, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and had loved the performance. And of course, Dear World was really kind of akin to Arcati in a way, yeah, because yeah. she was an eccentric, yeah, that's right. and uh, also embodied a lot of the movements <laughs> which Donald Sadler gave me for Dear World, which I have remained in my sort of you know, my, my muscular makeup there, but that those <laughs> movements were always there. So I used them for Arcati. Interesting. But, Actors it, always do that, you know. We always maintain, re retain all these things somewhere in us. The first man of our I believe, was Margaret Rutherford, the great, great British actress. Yes. Did you see her mo movie version? No, I did not. And, uh, and I saw a picture of her. I have it in my dressing room, in which she, she's wearing a shirt waist and yeah. a long skirt. Mm. 
Now, I, I had a whole different take on, on Akati, which was that she had probably been a very brilliant student. She'd probably gone to a women's college in England called Girton, mm -hmm. in which a lot of the sort of gym teachers and uh, teachers, period, mm -hmm. they, they were all trained at Girton. And that's why she has this very kind of militant way of talking and everything's for the team and all this. And, mm -hmm. that, and she came out of it with that. But she also had this artistic side to her, mm -hmm. which allowed her to become this writer of children's books, which are... Uh, and romances. She wrote kind of romance stories, you see. Right. Which they got I mean no no actress has a better entrance. That which is given by the other characters who talk about it for That's ten true. minutes. You're built up right. 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 <laughs> no. <Yeah. laughs> that must be a little daunting though. I mean you gotta live up to the hype. You have a, a, a really terrific director, Michael Blakemore, who's yes. been a guest on this show a number of times. Um, he's a very very analytical, very intellectual man. What is it that he told you in the cast some fundamental things to understand about this play because we think of Blythe Spirit as a comedy, a light comedy, and yet when I was watching it the other day, there's a seriousness under it, and I just wondered what Michael told you about this play, how to look at this play. Well, I think he just he kind of said this. He said this is really a comedy of manners. Mm -hmm. He said. We, we're, you were asked as, as performers to behave in a way that was normal and natural in the 1940s in that certain uh, class-ridden society which was Britain in, in, that, uh, in that era. You had the lower classes, lower being the, the servant class, you had the middle class, you had the upper middle class, and you had the highbrows, you know, the, the, uh, the people who had titles and that sort of thing. So uh, he said this, this concerns a middle, uh, upper middle class family who live in this village, and you, you behave in, in such a way that is commensurate with that, that class level that you live on. And uh, your attitudes are totally uh, different from anything that we we uh, we have today. Uh, all of that has gone from England, mm -hmm. but but at that time, Britain, uh, you know, this is the way they talked to their servants and etc. And uh, they, the servant class didn't expect to ever rise above it mm -hmm. because that was what they were born into, and they remained, except mm -hmm. in very singular circumstances. Do you remember that as a child? Uh, yes, I do. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. Except I came from a socialist family yeah. of <laughs> labor rights who didn't believe in any of that. Yes. So <laughs> our, our, you know, our, our, the people who worked for us were our, you know, we, we treated them like real people. Right. <laughs> well, and of course, yeah. and of course we know Noel Coward himself came from uh, rather modest circumstances Absolutely. as well, even though he styled himself as a great man of the drawing rooms of the world. In mm -hmm. fact, he was a fundamentally an outsider. Uh, he succeeded. He absolutely did. And Michael talked about this. Mm. And he said, so he's writing about something that he really understood very, very well. Coward, well, you know, understood. Because he didn't come from that group, but he admired them tremendously, and he wished to be like them, and did become like them, although he never, never lost sight of his uh, beginnings. How did you end up in America being an actress as, a, as such a young woman? Why, why did you come to America? Well, because I was fortunate enough to be among a very small group of youngsters, really, who were transported to America from England to escape from the London bombings. Mm -hmm. And my mother had the opportunity of bringing us and uh, shepherding us and a few other children to the States you know, through this organization which arranged it. It was rather almost like part of uh, Bundles from Britain, mm. you know. <laughs> and, uh, of course, Mr. Roosevelt at that time was doing everything in his power to help Britain without actually letting Congress know right. what he was right. up to, right. as we know, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> which is very interesting, really. So did you go on the, and your mother was an actress, wasn't she? My it? mother was yes. an actress and recognized that I had an innate talent. She knew from a very early age with that me. you had yeah. you had it. Both uh, me and my sister, we both did. But, but we both was there any uh, was any part of putting you on the stage have to do with that you had to make some money when you got here? Oh, certainly. Abs, yeah. But it, that was not the prime thing. She mm -hmm. was perfectly prepared to do that part of it. She wanted me to get the training and to have the opportunity to learn as much as of the, of the you know 
the nuts and bolts of being a performer before. She knew I could do it. She just wanted me to have the voice. She wanted me to, you know, have a, every opportunity <laughs> to finally make it. And, so and she, didn't, she didn't listen to Noel Coward who said, don't put your daughter on the stage, Mrs. Worthington. Exactly. <laughs> that was one of the songs I used to sing. I had a sort really? of a, an act that I did, uh -huh. which uh, was one of the first professional things I ever did was to appear in a cabaret in Montreal. And I did a, a whole act. And in it was, don't put your daughter on the stage, Mrs. Worthington. <laughs> I used to sing that. That's horrible. Yeah. So how, and how and other things from Red Peppers, you know, because a lot of Noah Carr never stopped writing wonderful material. Yeah, amazing for songs. Actors. Really? Would, you, would your mother have a slight Mama Rose quality to her? None at all. She, not at all. None what? If you had said to her, I don't want to do this, she would have. Oh, she would have backed right off. Mm -hmm. But she had nothing to do. Uh, the only thing she did for me, uh, of a, you know, a real hands on thing, was she helped me to learn and to deliver. The scene from uh, from uh, Romeo and Juliet, the, hmm. the balcony scene with Romeo, hmm. Romeo, Romeo. She helped you deliver it. She directed she you. No, she, no, no. Well, it, she she helped me. She it, we we went through it. I learned it, and then I would perform it with her. And then, of course, I had to go off and do an audition to get the scholarship to go to the drama school in London. That mm -hmm. was the first thing. And I was only fourteen at the time. I was actually only thirteen, and uh, but I was a very um, as they say, mature 13, mm -hmm. and uh, up here I was mature because my mother had always sort of treated me as a, uh, you know, on her own level, which was wonderful. And your father had died. My father was died. Yeah. Died, yes. so and I had had sort of had to move in and sort of be her an adult, be an adult, yeah. adult very yeah. young. Mm -hmm. um, well, how, how soon after coming to America <coughs> did, you, did you find yourself at MGM? Oh well, I, I arrived in 1940, and in four, by 43, yes. I was at MGM. Didn't they kind of like look at you and say, "Oh, well, you have to change your look," or sort of? Pick at you? Uh, well, they did, but what the, they couldn't pick at me too much in the yeah. first place because, you know, I hate to say this, but if you come out with two Academy Awards, that's right, that's well, yes, yeah. three two, years, right. Not about they're, they were a little bit hands off with me, good, mm. yeah, because they they really didn't know what they had, and I was kind of an unknown quantity, and I know I, I was also apparently what they called today uh, a character actress. Yeah. And yeah. and uh, they they really didn't have a place for that. They, they had uh, that wonderful um, actress. Uh, oh God, names absolutely. Yes, <laughs> gone. Finally, yes, Agnes <laughs> Agnes Moorhead. Agnes right. Moorhead. Agnes yeah. Moorhead, yeah. and a couple of other women who were very strong in the in the character department. But they were playing kind of dowdy. You know. Older ones. Well, I ended up playing dowdy too. Do, weren't you, you playing beyond your, above your age a lot as well? Always, yes. Always and that was because that. they said character actress type, and that's yeah. what you but do. But I was very useful, so they used to yeah. shove me into things. You clearly, even as, what were you, 18, or just mm -hmm. so you had substance. Do you think that's because you'd have gone through all this, this oh, oh, of course, travail yes. in life to get there? Um, yes and no. I think, I don't know. I, um, I can't allow, really, for how I managed to pull those things off. I really don't. I... <laughs> Um, I, I just I would f fill fill the slot as best I could, you know, and um, and it was always an acting exercise, always an acting exercise. But in those days, I have to tell you, the scripts were, v were very well read. Yeah. I, I, uh, written, well, yeah. They really were well written. You had wonderful screenwriters. You had said to us before we started taking <clears> sort of interesting the way Hollywood worked back then that you were an employee of the studio, mm -hmm. right? I mean, nowadays you think an actor achieves some level of fame and power and they get to dictate the terms in this. But you were pretty much told, this is the job, this is what you're going to do. Oh, absolutely. You, you, you were under contract, they paid you every week, and uh, they expected you to take any role that was proposed, you know, and you could fight it, and I did on a number of occasions. I, you know, I went to L.B. Mayer and I said, Mr. Mayer, why won't you let me play the role of, you know, Madame de Winter in Lady de Winter, I guess she was, in, uh, in uh, The Three Musketeers, you know, instead <laughs> of playing the Queen of France. And uh, <laughs> he said, Angie, he said, I want Lana to play de Winter. Uh. You're going to be a great queen. You know? yeah. so, so there I was. Was it a nerve-wracking experience to request an audience with the head of 
MGM? You bet it was. Really? It really was. In those days, it was. You had to, you had to make that appointment a week, a week ahead. You had to get through his three secretaries. He had one <laughs> real lioness of a woman who was his secretary, and I can't think of her name now, but she was famous, mm -hmm. and she vetted anybody who came in. He had an office in which you had to walk down. It's rather like visiting the Queen or somebody, mm -hmm. because he had a white desk at the end of a long corridor, in the, which was the office, you understand. Mm -hmm. And you had to walk down that and right up to the desk. You had to walk up to that big down. desk and yes. he... Yes, did he have he a c did. cigar, as we imagine him sitting there? And well, I don't know that he... he no, he, I never saw him with a cigar, oddly enough. But uh, in the end, we became friends. Really? Oh, absolutely. I used, I used to go to dinner at his house. We used to play gin rummy. <laughs> and, uh, he, you know, he was a very approachable person, really. But when it came to business and playing parts, he didn't mess around. <laughs> you were the Queen of France, and that I was it. I was the Queen of well, France. Well, I'm fast-forwarding your career to your remarkable performance in Manchurian Candidate, where you were mm. the most evil, demented woman I think that's ever been in, in movies. Was that, that just a script that came to you? That you No, no, it, that, came, that, that, that came about because I had previously been in a wonderful movie. I, I think it was a wonderful movie with Warren Beatty and uh, Eva Marie St. Carl Malden called All Fall Down, yes. Yes. Yes, sir, which know. was right. directed by John Frankenheimer. Right. Right. So w working with Frankenheimer for the first time as the, playing the mother again and again like that, um, he and I, um, a after a very rocky beginning, we didn't get along. We, we got along, but I, I just didn't come up to his, his uh, level of what he was looking for in the role. And I finally did. So it was difficult for me because I was playing a lot older again from, than I, you know, than my years. So, uh, but after we finished, we were, you know, he, he came to me and he put the, put the book of The Manchurian Candidate by Richard Condon on the table and said, Angie, this is your next role, The Mother. Mm. Mm. And I said, ooh, what's this, you know? And so I went home and read it pronto, and it was a huge book, mm -hmm. but I, I understood what he meant. Mm. And it was such an extraordinary... And there you were, the Queen of, was the Queen of Spades? Queen, queen of, of Hearts. Queen, no, of, queen hearts. of Diamonds. Queen of Diamonds, queen of that's diamonds. right, in that famous scene hearts. where you're... No, Diamonds. Yeah, where you're dressed. Did you see the remake of Manchurian Candidate? Yes. And? Yeah. No. <laughs> I thought everybody uh, acted their heads off and it was great, but how can you make a movie? Yeah, okay. How can you tell a story when you know, already know the secret? Yeah. Yeah. You know the story, right. you know, you know what she's why up to. Bother, right, no. to make that again. why bother? And now, um, we have the Tony Awards coming up and um, your great friend Jerry Herman is being given the Lifetime, yes, isn't it lovely? The lifetime so Achievement Award. Yes. Um, Jerry has been on the show a number of times, and he has told us uh, the story, and I'm curious from your perspective, mm. that uh, you were not necessarily the first choice to play Mame. Mm -hmm. And if I remember correctly, Jerry told me that he secretly rehearsed the songs with you before the audition. Yes. Really? He did. He did, and, yes. And, and how, did, how did you meet him? How did that come about? Well, uh, it came about through the producers, mm -hmm. uh, Jimmy Carr and uh, Bobby... Uh, Fryer? Fryer, yeah. that's right. Uh, they, they were kind of in favor, but they had another set of producers. Mm. And uh, they were the ones who, they were, they were having trouble persuading that I could bring this off, that I could bring in an audience and that I could carry a show. Yeah. And rightly so, I don't blame them. And uh, I, I say that, I knew I could, but I'm, what I'm saying is I understood their point of view. But... Because you were not an established musical theater no, Broadway star at, at this point. Not at all. The only big musical, big musical, the big flop musical, which was <laughs> Stephen's wonderful first outing with a, you know, music and lyrics, which was anyone can whistle. Right. But but it, that at least uh, introduced the idea that I, you know, I could sing and I sang in, sang in tune and that I knew knew how to get around the stage. That's about all. <laughs> as far as being a starter, no, I hadn't shown that. Mm. But uh, it certainly showed a glimmer of the beginnings of something possibly there. So uh, Jerry had seen that, mm. had seen that show. And it was on the basis of his seeing that that he decided I was going to be his main. Mm. And he never, never gave up. What was the song he taught you? He taught me um, It's Today. Mm. And then didn't he sneak in your audition? Didn't he sneak into the pit <laughs> and push the piano player aside and play for you? Yes, he did. He he <laughs> just went onto the thing and didn't let on that he was doing it. Uh, it was to give me moral support, was what it was. Yeah. And you know, I had to audition and audition and audition for that role. I didn't just get it. Uh, as, and they kept changing directors. 
mm -hmm. you know. And uh, <laughs> the final director, of course, was Gene Sachs. Who was married to your friend B. Arthur, who just B. died. B. Arthur, yes. Yeah. It was B. Arthur's husband at the time. And, and uh, thanks to him, who was an unusually kind of off-center director, mm -hmm. that he could see and understand me playing Mame. I just can't imagine anyone else playing Mame. You know, I, I didn't see the production, but uh -huh. the cast album is so mm -hmm. vivid. You know, when you yes. hear it, you can't imagine anyone else playing it. And, of course, Lucille Ball did to uh, her detriment and the movies. Oh, yes. um, Tragedy. <laughs> um, I know uh, you were great friends with B. Arthur, and you kindly spoke to me about, um, about her for a piece yes. I did. That friendship came about uh, because of Mame, right? In the first place, yes. But yeah. I think it really, it's interesting that it became a, a far more, had far more depth, shall we say, in, in later years. After she had done Maud, and also while she was doing uh, uh, Golden Girls, I was doing Murder, She Wrote, mm. we realized we were living very close together. Mm -hmm. And it was then that the real f friendship cemented. I mean, we really w were in and out of each other's houses. We were constantly trading off uh, ideas, r recipes. You know, we'd go to the movies together. We became very close. Mm. And uh, I valued that friendship more than I can tell you because I really hadn't understood who this woman was when we were doing Maine. Because when you're doing a big show like that, and I was the number one star in it. She had wanted to play Mame. Really? She oh, did? Yes. oh, yes. Oh, yes. Huh. And uh, naturally, I don't blame her, you know. I mean, actually, when you think about it, her looks and her attitudes and so on yeah. really would have lent themselves in a very interesting way to, to, to Mame. Yes, but then who yeah. could have been Vera Charles? <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah. indeed, I couldn't have been and Vera That's right. Vera Charles. I mean, and it would be no, no, skewed no, no. off. Right. It it but it was in California where it you became... Really? And you said something very interesting, I thought, about her, that the image that we had of her publicly as being, mm. you know, the, this tough broad with a withering look and a sarcastic cutting yes. remark, that was not really B. Arthur. No, 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 it wasn't. I, I'm not not saying that she didn't have a very hard edge when she needed to. Yes, she did. Yeah. Bless her. And uh, you know, I, I knew that. <laughs> but, um, and I, I, you know, she'd make me. I'd be on the floor with laughter sometimes. I think. But it was. But oh, nobody could tell a funny story like um, like be. <laughs> but there was a softness to her underneath it all. Oh, bless her. Oh, very much so. Yeah. She. Oh, God, yes. She mm. was the most softest person in the world, underneath all those layers of toughness, you know. We have to, I'm afraid we're out of time, I just want to ask you one final question. Um, you are um, uh, an actress of, uh, of, uh, of a certain age now, mm -hmm. and I'm curious to know, when you've come back to Broadway after, well you did Deuce a couple of years ago, and now Madame Arcati, uh, you were away from the stage for a fair amount of time. I, I, at your age, what is the thing you are most confident in doing on stage? What is the easiest thing to do? And what is the, the biggest challenge? Uh, what is the easiest thing? The, well, for me, acting is easy. Mm -hmm. uh, playing comedy is not easy. It's mm. difficult. But because I enjoy doing it, it's, it's wonderfully, you know, the feedback is tremendous. Mm -hmm. So. And your instincts for you know how to get a laugh, you know a movement uh, yeah. of the hand, of the eye, you just know your, your, your techniques to yes. get the audience. Yes, you get to exercise your technique as, a, as an actor, as, as, a, as a comedian. And we haven't talked about that, but I really am actually a comedian. And comedians are often very good at playing tragedy, mm -hmm. all kinds of things. Mm -hmm. So, in other words, this, this, uh, this link between comedy and tragedy is right there mm -hmm. and uh, it, it really works and both work I enjoy doing both right but I love doing comedy mm -hmm. and so uh, uh, coming back at my age to play comedy is probably the most comfortable thing I can do and what's the difficult thing though at uh, if you haven't been aw if you've been away from the stage for so long uh, um, just keeping up the the physical energy which mm -hmm. is required to send it across the footlights mm -hmm. I mean this is what I work towards and I take excruciating care of my body and my what I eat and how I conduct and you know live my life while I'm on stage mm. you know I really do and that's the thing I depend on to hold me up there and give me that thrust which gets it across the footlights because when you are of a certain age you know you don't have that extraordinary kind of ebullience that you do in youth yeah. and uh, you have to pretend that you do. Don't miss Angela Lansbury as Madame Arcati <laughs> doing 
<laughs> unforgettable <laughs> dance, an interpretive spiritual dance, uh, mm -hmm. in Bly Spirit at the Schubert Theater. Angela Lansbury, thanks a lot for being, oh, for being been, our guest. It's been such fun. Thank you for having me. If I say that your tongue is vicious, if I call you uncouth, it's simply that who else but a bosom buddy will sit down and tell you the truth. When did you discover these extraordinary powers that you had them? Well, when I, when I was quite tiny. You see, my mother was a medium before me, so I had the opportunity of starting on the ground floor. 